the Russians actually sort of they regarded us some, so, as like, wow, these guys are tough guys because we came across in the rubber dinghy up the pilot ladder and went through their ship, and then we drank a load of vodka and went down the pilot ladder off, across again to our own ship. I have incidents where I can't remember how I came back. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Lieutenant Commander Jürgen Brandsborg joined the Danish Navy in the 1980s. He met the Soviets up close and personal while serving in the North Atlantic, where the Danish Navy acted as a coast guard when on patrol around the Faroe Islands. This role meant boarding Soviet vessels for inspection. He also tells of Danish Navy training, Denmark's position within NATO, as well as their defence plans should the Cold War have turned hot. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you subscribe in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Our reviews really help the podcast grow, so if you are enjoying our content, please leave a written review in Apple Podcasts or share us on social media. If you can spare it, I'm asking listeners to contribute three US dollars per month to help keep us on the air. Larger amounts are welcome too. You get the sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a monthly financial supporter of the podcast, and you bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And a special thanks to our latest Patreons. Now, back to today's episode. Jürgen tells of close encounters with the Volksmarine, the East German Navy, including attempted rammings of Danish naval vessels by both the Soviet and East German Navy. We welcome Jürgen to our Cold War conversation. I'm a uh, year 64, born in Copenhagen, and uh, grew up in Copenhagen um, with uh, uh, my parents are from the war generation. I have two brothers and uh, just basically a normal Danish working class background, uh, s- standard schooling, went to high school, and from high school I joined the military, I joined the Navy. Um, and stayed in the Navy for about 20 years and retired a lieutenant and commander. Um, and I grew up in the uh, as a teenager in the 70s, so I had all this uh, reheating of the Cold War, had all the SALT uh, agreements, and we had the, uh, while I was in high school, we had the Russian invasion of Afghanistan and the uh, emergencies in Poland. So um, I was all hyped and ready to go and knock out some commies when I joined the Navy that, t- that time. <laughs> uh, so so why, why did you decide to, to join the Navy and not do something else? I guess I read too many Battle of Britain, actually, when I was a kid. Uh, <laughs> it, it was a thing... Uh, we are a maritime family. Uh, my father was an, a sailor. My mother, even my mother, has a discharge book, uh, and they're from Esbjerg, uh, which is in the west country of Denmark, and that's a fishing port. Uh, that's where we either we get, uh, catch all the cod, and we export all the bacon to the UK from Esbjerg. Actually, uh, so it's in our blood. Um, my uncle was in the navy, and he persuaded me not to join the army, so I became a gentleman of the sea instead. And uh, also growing up with uh, actually that what many doesn't realize is the fact that Denmark was definitely a frontline state. Uh, yeah. Any 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 new build from any of the Russian uh, shipyards in the Baltic had to pass through the Danish Straits to get out 
So uh, we were like number one intelligence platform for anything maritime, actually, that went in and out those straits. And uh, also it was interesting because uh, even though we were frontline state, um, we had a political climate w- which was sort of strange. Uh, <laughs> I went to <laughs> I went to high school in in the upper uppity part of uh, Copenhagen, uh, born and bred in a working class environment. I ended up in the northern part, which is sort of like Mayfair kind of style. And right, okay. <laughs> what I noticed was the richer the kids were, the more communists they were. Uh, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that, that doesn't really compete. Uh, and what sort of really won me over, if we can use that phrase, was that when uh, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, they were all cheering up because now the socialist spirit and everything will come and uh, remove the evil capitalist oppressors. So, what? <laughs> I was going, excuse me. Uh, and then Poland again, of course, with the uh, Jaroszewski regime and the whole the whole Solidarność movement was. Yeah, well, I, I kind of knew what, which way, way I was going um, yeah. from then. <laughs> so when when you joined the NATO, what was the initial training like? Can you describe that for me? That was the, – the Danish Navy is – I have to brag here. We are the oldest one around, um, for one thing. Really? Older than the Royal Navy? Yeah, we had our 500-year celebration for about seven years ago, so we're old. Okay. Okay. I'll let you have that one, Jürgen. <laughs> yeah. Well, you stole our ships in 1807, and we never forgave oh, you. Oh, come on! Surely you can forgive us for that now. Never. <laughs> <laughs> this could uh, be a very short episode. <laughs> ah, no worries. No. Um, Let's keep going. Uh, you so could, the training. Back to the, the tra- training. <laughs> Training was um, the fact is that uh, when you tra- join the navy as, uh, as a line officer, uh, you have to go through the same maritime training as a uh, mate would do in the merchant marine so we have uh, both uh, uh, civilian maritime training and then we have the military training on top so when i came out uh, from the academy i had my commission and i also had my uh, coc as a mate which made us rather spe- special because of the the policy actually was that if we had to police the seas we need to be at least at the same level of knowledge that, as the ones we were policing. So it, it was special uh, in those days. And uh, it was, what, five, yeah, training, basic training, 18 months. Uh, spent on some time as a petty officer uh, at, um, at basic training. Uh, had my own pl- training classes for about two months. Or was that just to practice what we learned at the Petty Officer School. And uh, then we were vetted once again. I think we uh, were vetted one or three, three, four times by psychologists during that uh, period. And then we were admitted to the uh, Naval Academy. Um, And that was three hard years there with schooling and sailing. And um, so that actually meant that every summer we went to, we went uh, to sea and we joined either the training squadron or uh, active serving vessels, uh, which meant I spent a lot of time as a midshipman on board uh, patrol vessels in the Baltic. So that was down there to meeting the Russians, actually, and the East Germans and the Poles, of course. Uh, we had all three in our backyard. Um, right. And we will come on to that, won't we? Oh, yeah, we will. <laughs> Just going back, you mentioned the vetting. What what sort of questions were they asking you? Yeah, all sorts. So, or so, yeah, they want to find out if you're like mental, mentally stable, right? Uh, especially for, for instance, if you wanted to be a submariner, or you were going to join the fast attack craft when you had uh, access to the fire button for like eight harpoon missiles. So <laughs> they needed sort of uh, steady, well grounded men and women uh, for, for those jobs, right? And uh, also because you have to deal with what we're actually dealing with now, you have to deal with sort of a social isolation for a lot of times, um, especially once we're sent to Greenland. Uh, an average cruise on uh, Greenland would be 122 days. Wow. 
Yeah, so <laughs> you had to yeah. be able to hack that one as well, right? So, so and were, were they checking out your politics as well in that vetting? No, no, or, no, 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 not really, because uh, one of my classmates was a glowing social democrat, uh, and that was not a problem. Uh, because our governments were like uh, up through the 60s and 70s and 80s were like jumping from each side uh, of the parliament all the time. Socialists, social democrats, uh, liberals, uh, conservatives and, and and coalitions. So it was all a mix. And also uh, the um, the idea is that the, uh, the, the armed forces have to uh, reflect the populace, right? So obviously, we didn't see any real crazy communists or uh, or, or Nazi types. They they were vetted out, uh, but uh, but rather the full spectrum of what we say inside the normal envelope of Danish politics was represented here. Right, right. And you you mentioned women in the navy as well. Were they serving in the front line in the Danish navy? Uh, yeah. They were. Wow. Uh, there weren't uh, weren't too many, uh, but they increased in number as uh, during uh, the time I served. Um, the first mm. officers were out in the late seventies, and they served uh, on board first line units. Right, right. So Danish Navy was quite ahead of its time then, compared to some of the other NATO nations, I would imagine. Oh yeah, uh, especially when when we sort of like, uh, and that was what was that? That was in in the in the early nineties. They decided to do away with uh, a special uh, woman's uniform for the ratings. So we went unisex and all Donald Duck uh, uniform for all, traditional Jack Tar uniform for all ratings. Also the girls, right? And the international press went like, Ooh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was like it, 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 the, the the journalists and the photograph, photographers were over these girls like flies and sh in that week, and it was crazy. Was it a quiet news week or not? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't it was. Uh, I, think, I think the American armed forces news were there. Uh, obviously, it was Germany, and it was a big NATO thing, so they were there. Uh, but right, and how how big was the Danish Navy at this point? So this was. Uh, mid eighties. The mid eighties. Yeah, well, it's gone downhill since then. Uh, well, we 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 are no we are no destroyers. With the biggest ships we had were frigates. There were four. There were just, you know, two old ones, three new ones. Then there was four patrol vessels for the Arctic, and one more newer patrol vessels. Then we had like what seven submarines and. Oh, those are, I think, oh, close to 18 fast attack crafts and a lot of smaller vessels and a whole shitload of mine countermeasures and mine warfare vessels. Right, right. Presumably to, uh, well, to block the, uh, the Danish Straits, yeah? Precisely. Uh, us, the Turks, the Greeks, and the Belgians were big on mines, um, on the offensive mining bit. Um, all the all other navies went mine countermeasures, but we were and the Norwegians did it too. Uh, were big on actually mining our own waters, and it, right. look, looking at the geography, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, is that the Kattegat? Is that what it's called? Yeah, actually, you have to go a little bit uh, further south uh, to the belts. The Great Belt is the only deep water route out from the Baltic. Right. And that runs straight through Danish territorial waters. Yeah. Yeah. I remember reading about that in the history of the um, the Bismarck and the Prince Eugen yeah. um, breaking out through the yeah. Great Belts, I think. Yeah. They came from Kiel. Uh, that's yeah. made perfect sense. Um, also, of course, we were very uh, much aware that uh, the time of reaction we had in case – that something bad should come from south was very short. So uh, we were also very much on actually defensive mining our coastlines because we have very shallow water, so it's actually perfect for amphibious warfare. And uh, when the Warsaw Pact uh, <laughs> had their spring exercises, um, we were like sort of, Wary would be 
a polite way of saying it, because all they had to do actually was issue live ammunition and then we would be free. Right, right. And I think I've seen a plan, uh, a Polish plan of invasion, which the uh, Warsaw Pact one that came out after the end of the Cold War, and it did show significant amphibious landings in Denmark. Yeah, basically that was the mild version. Yeah, so the Russian version were more or less like uh, one tactical nuke for every five square kilometers. Right, right. But Denmark didn't allow any uh, NATO nuclear weapons nope, stationed nope, on its that, territory, that, did it? That, that was a big thing. Uh, we had this footnote uh, politics, which uh, for for us serving made no sense. Uh, but it, it was very important because they were also, of course, the 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 um, government had to honor our obligations nato wise but we had the russians sitting on a doorstep so we had to sort of kind of please not not the entirely like like finland but also have to show something that we weren't that that we weren't nasty we weren't aggressive or anything but we were still in nato yeah and anyway they were just south of the border so they could be here within two hours anyway so yeah wouldn't they have had to get through the british first though no, the the um, which one the the worst uh, some of the Americans uh, short to middle distance missiles were actually sitting down there in storage down in Germany. Yeah, yeah, but I thought that the uh, British Army of the Rhine was stationed mainly in uh, northwest Germany. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And uh, same was that the in the old days uh, we had the, what was called the uh, Jutland Division which was to link up with the sister division in Germany and then close the gap north of the Army of the Rhine. Right. And and what were you, you know, in the course of your training, what were you told about the Soviets and, and their intentions? Actually, very little. Uh, we had some briefings with the uh, Defense Intelligence Services and they were like very, very, uh, if you think like, if you think spooked, you have spook squared. Uh there was something, and they, it, it, we can't tell because we have to kill you. Sort of, sort of story going on there, and actually, most of it we we experienced by ourselves, actually, by meeting them at sea. Right, right. Which I, I, it sounds like we need to come on to that now. Then, yeah. See, there's two 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 situations uh, where the Danish Navy of, often came across the Russians. That was patrolling own waters, and then. Um, doing Coast Guard duties on Greenland and on the Faroe Islands, especially the Faroe Islands. Uh, I spent a quite quite uh, a lot of days up there and uh, contro- checking and boarding Russian vessels. And, um, you know, you have to, uh, what we saw uh, or what the, the, portray, the po- portraying that Russians wanted to front was that Russia is this super-checked, super heavy, super strong, super organized power that you see on the Victory Day Parade, right? Yeah. We met the Russians, uh, not those Russians, but the real Russians. We met them on board these vessels. Um, So these were civilian vessels, were they? Yeah, yeah, massive, massive uh, factory vessels, uh, fish in one side, one end, and canned fish in the other end, right? So full, full factory. Some hundred uh, people on board, um, and it was like a, a, a mini Russian community. Right. So, so this was the Soviet Herring fleet, was it? No, it, it was Blue Ling, but it could be Herring as well. But they, they were right. when they were in Fair, Fair Islands, they fished for this crazy fish. It tasted like shit, but apparently the Russians liked it, and uh, there were plenty of it. So the Faroe Islands obviously earned a lot of money in tax from the Russians fishing up there. Um, that's fine. And uh, we did the checking and did some intelligence work as well. Um, because, of course, um, what was, was realized that the Russians, you see, like portrayed in in uh, TV shows or what the Americans want us to believe that how they were, that they are not the ones we met. They were down to earth Easygoing guys, of course they were. We, they were out there for half a fucking year, so <laughs> so us coming on board was like, wow, something happens, and it was all 
very interesting because when we came on board, we, we were extremely official. Check papers, check log, check navigation tracks, check everything. From top of the mast to down to the keel, we went through the entire ship, recorded everything, and then stamped the books. Boom. And it was all brothers of the sea afterwards. Mm -hmm. The Russians actually sort of, they regarded us as like, wow, these guys are tough guys because we came across in the rubber dinghy up the pilot ladder and went through their ship. And then we drank a shitload of vodka and went down the pilot ladder off across again to our own ship. I have incidents where I can't remember how I came back. <laughs> and a pilot ladder like, like that is eight meters. So that's a tricky maneuver then. <laughs> Now, After you've had vodka. Now maybe you just roll in, in sync with the ship and everything is fine. I think. But <laughs> anyway, what, what we learned from that was actually that we were always invited to a meal. And the interesting thing is that these guys were definitely, we would say, poor. But still, when we came on board, they rolled out the best they had for us. And wanted to talk about everything not about not about the political systems but about being sailors about family about the weather and about the things that takes up time in our everyday life when you're on board a ship that was what they were interested in they didn't see us as an enemy and neither did we them actually um there's no fight uh, we had the guns and they had only one they had a troll they could throw herrings at us yeah no <laughs> fight there um so it, it was interesting, and also it was interesting to follow because I did that uh, through some periods of years, um, from before the Iron Curtain went down to after the Iron Curtain went down, and you could see how much of a crisis uh, the whole system was in because the ships began to look more and more dilapidated as the years went by. And you could also see which republics were doing well and which republics were not doing well. You could simply see it on the stage of maintenance of the ships. Polish-run vessels always look good. The ones with uh, base ports in the Baltic look good, but the ones from Murmansk or Arkhangelsk look like shit. Right. Right. Uh, but more more extreme conditions up in Murmansk, anyway. Yeah, also, but you could see it on the the um, equipment, mm -hmm. the state of maintenance, uh, and the, how they repaired their kit. So, so that's that. That was sort of like what we call that. That would be econo economical intelligence. Actually, we, we we were doing there because we could see. Okay, these guys have the newest radars. These guys still have this old one, size of a Volkswagen, more mm -hmm. or less, and. And you could actually, you could see these things and you could see it by their clothes. You could see it by their general state of health. That they were from a, a really, really poor region, right? Whereas mm. the Poles and the other ones were well-fed and well-dressed. Right. And and when you boarded these ships, you said you searched them from the top of the mast to the keel. What were you looking for? Basically, because we were doing po Coast Guard duties for for the, the ferries authorities, right? So it was worth they trying to cheat. Did they have illegal uh, tools on board? Did their books match or their, uh, their catch? But also everything else we could find, of course. Um, new radio equipment, something strange equipment on the bridge that wasn't there the last time we were there. Right. Because the Soviets did use uh, trawlers for spy ships, didn't they? Oh, definitely did. Um, and that that was one of the things that we were acutely aware of, of obviously, when we went on board. If there was a new th thingy, thingamajig on the bridge, Captain, what's that? And if it, 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 normally they just told it was was. So, okay, these guys are not spies. But in the Baltic... Uh, as the so-called fishing vessels, uh, well, many of them were close to capsizing for from the amount of antennas. So, uh, and them we knew definitely, and uh, we always, when we were on patrol there, we always went close by to see and count any new antennas on board. 
anything new, anything new, and and we took always took a shitload of pictures of the of them. Right. Simply, simply because oh, there's something new there, and then we had our experts, uh, the ones behind three or four layers of closed doors and with big spectacles, would look and they would come with some sort of assumption. This might be. And this is important because um, for us, uh, one of the most important things was that we had to be very much aware of our electronic countermeasures. Uh, preferably, if we could, all communication was uh, Morse light. Right. No so em- by land. Yeah, no emissions yeah. at all. Um Mainly because if you emit, uh, you will actually be a missile magnet, basically. Mm-hmm. And we didn't have that many ships, so radio silence, if you can, blackout on all comps, and uh, then visual signaling, that was the expertise. Um, right, so real old school definite. communication, really. Yeah, it works. It yeah. really works. Uh, so the the trawlers that had all the antennae, did you board those as well? No, because they were in inter- in international waters. So so they stayed they outside. Did, they just m- outside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it was like when they dropped the anchor, they knew how long their chain was. That so when they were swaying for this anchor, they wouldn't. But very close to our territorial borders. So we went out, we scared them a little bit, and they looked, and, and we went in again. That was that was kind of like the gentleman thing to do. It was, it was not a formal a procedure, but it was the way things were done. Same when we when we were like going from a naval base Copenhagen to Bornholm to for patrol, passing just north of the Polish border, there was always the Polish patrol vessel came out to oh. Just to control, oh, it's the same ship again. And then they went in again. And we said, oh, it's them. We knew each other. Yeah. You know, you mentioned the poles before. So you you were checking their fishing boats as well. Yeah, on Bonholm we did. Actually, the poles were allowed to dock their fish on Bonholm. The poles were, not not the Germans or not the the Russians. Right. Why did the poles get an exception? I don't know. Actually, I I really don't know, but it was just funny because there's always been a, apparently been a good good relation there, and um, we I don't know how many Russian vessels I've thrown out of our three mile zones. Um, later on, as as I said, the um, the crisis became more and more tangible. Uh, the economy was visually decreasing. The the, the standards of maintenance were you could see it from day to day, more or less, on the vessels. So a vessel crossing from, say, Kalin- uh, some, yeah, Kaliningrad or Leningrad going out came across bad weather uh, in the Baltic, which you frequently do. Uh, wind blowing from the east, they had to. They tried to hug the claw, the shoreline of Bornholm, and often hugged it so close that they went in the three line mile line. And we had to sail out and throw them out. And when you say throw them out, what what, what does that entail? <laughs> uh, that's uh, a polite the conversation uh, over loud hailer. <laughs> right. And never used weapons because uh, they so respected the the grey ships. They also knew that we were the guys who were going to pick them out if they came into trouble. Into trouble. We were the ones who were doing yeah. search, and, search and rescue as well. So they they behaved. <laughs> the problem was that the Russians often, when they dropped anchor, they took uh, the opportunity to, to drain a pair of hexaliters of vodka as well. Right. <laughs> so so, so yeah. I came, you, you came up alongside and you tried to get them on the radio. Nothing happened. So you try the radio again, nothing happened. Then you try the Morse lamp, the Aldis lamp, nothing happened. Then you just jammed the klaxon all the way down and just sat there waiting until somebody came on the bridge. 
They did, and they were usually very drunk. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know how many times I've heard you, moment, please, moment, please, get captain, get, get, get captain. Then a lot of noise, and about two or three minutes, and then the captain came online. It was a, uh, yeah. he's, he's captain. And then you just, <laughs> just throw them. You can anchor in here, but you have to ask the naval district about permission first. I have now your name and number, so don't do it again. <laughs> and they were oh, oh sorry, I are we gonna are we gonna have a night? No. You're here, you're safe, stay safe. And then yeah. it was very like okay, we we just we've waved the thinker at them and did a na 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 and they listened because next time they would call. Right. So, so it was. It was very much. It was a very low key. Yeah. Uh, the um, the ones who were never low key was the East Germans. No, I wanted to ask you about them. So, tell me more about how how the East Germans were. Yeah, well, they were they were just just like Nazis with new, new uniforms, mostly in in the way that they went about their business. It was it was uh, tight, it was straight, and it was tough. Uh, they were extremely aggressive as well uh, around their borders. Uh, we have several incidents about collisions with uh, Danish patrol vessels who were actually not inside uh, the uh, these German borders, and they just rammed them. Right. So we had to take that to the International Court of Sea to have this settled, and they got the blame every time. Right. So nobody really. So that, that's. I mean, that is sort of like one of the ultimate no nos, isn't it? At, at sea to deliberately yeah, ram another ship. Yeah. Uh, we had one incident uh, during the mid seventies where a Russian patrol frigate actually rammed a Danish vessel. Um, or not rammed. He um, glanced it, if you so say. <laughs> they touched sides. Yeah. Right. But the interesting thing is, if you watch the pictures on this one, you can see that all the uh, fire direction uh, directing radars are aimed directly at the Danish vessel as well. Right. So right. that that's not a coincidence, right? This is no. that that's definitely aggressive action. Yeah, and why why did the the Soviets get get too close to that that ship? Did they think it had breached their territorial waters? It would typically be like that, or they were up, they were doing something uh, exercise wise, and uh, obviously, if they were international waters or close to their own territorial borders, mm. we would just loiter outside and look. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so they probably wanted to chase them away because they knew that this mine layer was also an electronic warfare platform. Right. And pre presumably during the things like the spring exercises, then Precise precisely. You, the whole Danish Navy was out to try and listen in and see what was going on. Yeah. And if we were to knock, we called up the Germans and the Norwegians as well. Right. And the more cameras, the more binoculars the better picture. Uh, and it, it was these exercises in the 80s, in the early 80s, they were massive. Yeah. Really big ones. Um, and it was normal that a couple of hundred soldiers died. It, well, as to realism, it, it is massive scale. There is, a, you can find them on, uh, on YouTube. There is one called Sapad, which actually means West. So that's sort of, tells yeah. you what what's gives about. away yeah. yeah gives it away a bit and there, there was it was full size uh landings brigade size landings not one or two vessels but full brigades and divisions of marines assaulting uh east germany in, in most cases because they had a beach line who uh, which oddly enough looked a lot of uh, like the two neighboring danish islands to the north Right, right, and you you mentioned the the ramming of the Danish ship. Is that a, on YouTube as well? No, but I can find the pictures for you. No problem. Okay, no that that would be no that would be really useful to um to uh, show those. Um, were there any attempts by any of these ships to defect to the west? 
Not that I know of, but uh, we've picked up quite a few uh, defectors from uh, from um, East Germany. Right. See, we had a light vessel down there, and it was in in, in all sense a beacon. <laughs> it yeah. was. It, it sort of attracted them, and uh, we've had uh, the Eastern German border and border police coming really close. Uh, but never, never uh, breached uh, that piece of Danish territory at all. Uh, but they have definitely been aggressive down there, right? And and so uh, these were East Germans using small boats, or or how how were they getting yeah, to it, the uh, vessel? Uh, some some of them even tried to swim, but otherwise small boats, uh, canoes, like you know, like the Cockleshell hero style. Yeah. Uh, uh, some Eastern Germans even did it on windsurfers. <laughs> yeah, so how far how far was this vessel uh, from the East German coast then? If you go to Rügen, which is uh, the island protruding most north, it would be what five, maybe five, five, eight, ten miles north of nautical miles, just in in the international shipping lane. Right. Uh, so we're sitting right on choke point there, uh, south of Gesa, and all ships came by there. So we were also an intelligence platform. These guys were excellent in um, in recognizing changes in the ships going in and out because what else could they do? Oh yeah, they could polish the lens, <laughs> eat, eat sun, count, uh, and then look at ships. Right. Um, so it, it it was normal that we were present down there because we know things happened, uh, and also um, we were a little bit a little bit on, on a challenge there because there was a gap, a small gap in our radar coverage there. Else, the most of the Danish coastline was covered, but right there was, there was a hole. So um, if the light vessel wasn't doing it, there was always a naval patrol vessel sitting down there. Right. Right. And and were you involved in any operate where you actually picked up these East Germans? No, uh, not that. But uh, I've been uh, involved in a lot of smuggling down there. Um, and I don't know whether it was they were smuggling out, but they're definitely smuggling out uh, something out on fishing vessels. So we had to tail them. Um, the police never told us what it was, but it was just told that one. Follow him. Okay, we did, uh, and they were right. going. To, and they were going to Bonholm. Okay, and these were East German vessels. East German and Polish commercial vessels, yeah. That were smuggling some unnamed items to Pro- Bornholm. Probably alcohol. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. that, that was the only thing they had they could barter with. That that would be vodka or or just pure alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, and if one one thing was uh, another in, interesting thing about the Poles and and Bornholm was that um, a friend of mine he said he actually was a cook on on our vessel he was went out to buy some provisions up in Nixer, which was on the uh, eastern side of Bornholm and he came across these Polish fishers fishermen and they asked him are the Danes very poor and he said what are you very poor. Not to my knowledge, <laughs> yeah. But 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 uh, all your your shelves in this store is full. <laughs> so the implication was that they didn't have enough money to buy anything, rather than yep. um, they yeah, they were well stocked. Yep. Brilliant. So so that was these interesting things. Also, um, these fishermen was also an indication. We learned a lot about the the sentiment in Poland uh, in the early to mid mid eighties, uh, which was uh, tense to say the least. Yeah. Uh, they were followed uh, really really closely, and uh, many of them had to also report to the intelligence services when they have been to Denmark, obviously. Um. We never, we never had this, you know, this uh, paranoia about spies and born out vessels, um, because the fact was that we were extremely open about everything we did, and also this that we were not screening people politically. 
was that it gave a very relaxed and open and, dare I say, honest um, with uh, climate on board and also with all these Stasi files, um, which has come to light, is that we have, haven't found anyone inside the Danish military as such. Right. We found a lot inside politics, in business, and culture. Ooh. Yeah. Um, but not really. Not really. We, we had two guys who went down to Poland to try to spy down there. And uh, I think they got about five kilometers into the country, and then they were arrested. It was very, very embarrassing. But they were, they were army folks, so we weren't too surprised. Um, but that, that, was, that was a bit of a scandal. Uh, otherwise, no. Um, we sort of relied on on uh, the uh, the West German intelligence service uh, to help us out in that one, and then we kept tap on the Russians. Um, you know, um, the uh, one of our like the <laughs> the glory hour of the Danish Navy is uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, actually. Really? Yeah, uh, because we were able to feed the Americans real-time information about these vessels with the missiles on board. Right, the the merchant ships that were going down to Cuba. Pre- pre- so pre- did they come through the Baltic then? Or? Yes, they did. Uh, okay. part, past aforementioned light vessel, uh, past two uh, naval lookout stations uh, where the Great Belt is the narrowest, the Air Force obviously, obviously buzzed them more or less continuously. And then we could just report to them that these vessels uh, at that time spotted heading north uh, have now turned and are going best speed south again. Um, and of course, this is very valuable information, especially when Kennedy is pressing Khrushchev when you want to play. And, and then you have uh, from firsthand information that they've turned around yeah yeah wow i didn't know that no it's one of the lesser known ones it's also was a it's also that one uh the um missile crisis and then uh, czechoslovakia in 68 was two of the most tense periods in the danish defense at all uh because uh, the information flow was very good, and everybody thought, "Oh shit, the nuclear and the nukes will drop in five minutes." So we had a lot of open ulcers in those periods, and uh, the old guys who were around when I joined in told me about those days and said there was borderline panic. Right, and with Czechoslovakia in '68, the the concern was that. It wouldn't just end in Czechoslovakia. They... No, because the fact, the fact that the Czechoslovakians fought back, and maybe the Russians could do uh, uh, like a reverse Hitler sort of kind of say, okay, there was American agents. Yeah, yeah, which they did claim that there were American agents. Obviously, is yeah. is is always the Americans, those pesky Americans, yeah. uh, and that was another thing. Uh, they learned that we were not Americans when we were dealing with the Russians. As soon as they learned we were not Americans, the uh, sort of the conversation and everything just sort of changed gear. Because then we were not the we were not really the enemy. We were just other guys from NATO, and besides that, we were other sailors. Yeah. That's the, the American sort of way of approaching this is always very much in your face. And uh, when dealing with, with Russians, that's definitely, that's completely counterproductive. So you were like friendly but firm. Fir- firm but friendly. Firm first, friendly afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I mean, in your, in your career in the Navy, what, what would you say was the most difficult situation? you had to deal with during the cold war it was actually it it was on the end of the cold war uh it was dealing with these these russians who were actually so full of hope they were hoping for 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 a better thing to come uh they were left 
on these vessels and and they didn't know if they were going to get any supplies they didn't know if they were paid they didn't know anything and you should, I couldn't do anything about it I could just do my job and and tell them everything is going to be okay and if you need something acutely we can come across with it and just see this gratitude for some simple spares like some lubrication or some some degreasing was for, for fixing engines or, or simply bolts and that kind of things. They didn't have it. So what we learned that way was that this realization that this so-called monster was in reality was a paper tiger. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hear about, you know, that the, there were some effective units between uh, in the Soviet armed forces, but there was a lot of not such good certainly equipment anyway, knocking around. When you came closer to the ships, you could see it. And obviously with, with so na- such narrow waters as the Danish ones, you get close to the, the Russian vessels, like 100, even 50 meters. You can see it. Mm. See, um, just when, uh, when everything was starting to collapse, uh, there was a squadron of Russian training vessels was in Copenhagen. They were um, alongside on Langadinia, which is the sort of like the parade key in Copenhagen. That's where the shipping lines, all military vessels go there. And there was these two sailing vessels and one uh, diesel uh, propelled vessel was there. And um, these Russian midshipmen, they were selling everything out the portholes. We were out there, and a, a couple of friends were there, and 50 kronos, I got two caps, officers' caps. Mm. And, and then my friend, he said, like, just, just for fun, the game, he said, Kalashnikov? And this guy, hmm. I said, I said 200 krona. Da! And then he went <laughs> across. No, 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 it was a joke. It was a joke. It was a joke. Wow. <laughs> yeah, then, no, I, th- I think you're right. You know, that desperation um of when the economy was really um in trouble there um certainly was one of one of the reasons why uh, the soviet union you know finally folded was that perestroika and glasnost didn't live up to the expectation no the the, the system couldn't handle this kind of change simply yeah and, and it what as for my and my colleagues, we were simply amazed about the the speed of this. It was like reverse exponential. It was just boom, it imploded. Their armed forces simply the navy imploded. Yeah, yeah. And did you find you know when the Berlin Wall opened? Did the East German behaviour change relatively quickly from being? as you describe them, Nazis, to being more friendly or not? <laughs> yeah, well, I think the common East German was um, was changed quickly. But the Korea soldiers, the Korea policemen, they were like we were, they were vetted, but they were definitely vetted on their politics, right? Yeah. Uh, if you want to make a career, that was also taken over from the Nazis. If you want to make a career, you have to be a member of the party. And and if you have if you looked at these Germans, they had the same insignia, they had the same style of clothing, they had the st- same style of everything. They only changed the tone of grey just a little bit. Everything else was old school German. Even their steel helmet. So so they, it was business. Okay, okay. Now we are not national socialists. Now we are we are people socialists. Mm. And on they went. Uh, I hate to so, so, sort of stereotyping, but that's the Germans, and they're, they're definitely that's what they're forced. They can do this, um, and then when when they say, "Okay, we got rules. We want to run our systems according to these rules," they bloody well us. They run them. Yeah. And what we experienced with the West with West Germans was that they 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 were the same way, but they were timid. They had this burden of their past. So they never made any fuss or anything. They just did their job and they were damn good at it. That's one thing. 
but they never made anything big. They never really joined the parties. They were, they were really like this. They were guilt-ridden. Hmm. The East Germans, my uh, impression was that they said, okay, we've cleared our past. We've been de Now we're socialists. Let's go. Otherwise, it was, to, to a very high extent, business as usual. I was in Berlin. I was in Berlin when I was in high school. I was in Berlin in 81. I saw East Berlin um, in the old, uh, old way. And the contrast between West and East Berlin were massive. Uh, they had all the museum. They were high on history. They were high on culture. Great museums uh, to to for for a student. Um, but also, it was it was strange. You had this uh, feeling that you were being watched all the time. Obviously, Westerners, yes. Um, crossing from east uh, from west to east in Berlin was was a thing. Um, I remember one of the girls from my class, she was like, you know, late seventies, early eighties, punk rock. So she had spiky pink hair, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and leather, like, like, like female Sid Vicious style. Right. Uh, right. and, uh, un- unfortunately <laughs> her passport showed another girl with nice long hair. And this guy in this booth, when we're going from Friedrichstraße, he was like looking down and he was looking up and he was looking down and he was looking up. He, he continued that uh, about mm-hmm. a minute. And then he asked, uh, Wovon sind Sie? Where are you from? Uh, yeah. uh, Copenhagen. Uh, ah, Christiania, he said. Okay. That, that, and then we passed. Okay. We were here. <laughs> <laughs> and another th- great thing that many doesn't pre- re- appreciate is that. Um, Danish, what we call what do we call it? Uh, Danish comedy was very much liked by the Eastern Germans because Danish comedy often was about the little man winning over the big man. So that was actually the worker winning over the capitalist. Yeah. So we had uh, this uh, series of, of films, sort of like uh, Carry On style. Uh, about uh, a gang of criminals who always has this extremely ambitious plan and it always some very, very nasty capitalist who is the crook and they almost succeed. They were, they were actually national heroes in Eastern Germany. What was that called, that program? Uh, it was called Olsen Benton or the Olsen Gang. Yeah, I've yeah, no, I have heard I have heard of that. I mean in in the UK we had a comedian called Norman Wisdom. Yeah. Who was very much the downtrodden worker against the factory boss and he was a huge hero in Albania. Um <laughs> in, in a similar way in a yeah. similar way to the Olsen yeah. um, gang. <laughs> we uh, also a television series about uh a simple uh, um, a little small block of flats, just one stairs of flats, uh, and the people living there, and they were just ordinary people as well. They were also shown on East German television. Right. And as a TV series or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Also comedy. Yeah. Uh, went for like four or five seasons. I don't know. Something like uh, – EastEnders kind of style, but with a comedy <laughs> comic comic twist, right? Yeah. Um, and then on the other, we in our stores we had tons of uh, East German uh, tableware and uh, Czech tableware and Polish woodwork things uh, because they were sitting on our doorsteps, so we did trade with them. So we we were like that strange country we was actually. More or less one three quarter foot inside NATO, and then the t- the toes just wiggling outside the fence. I mean, where where were you, or can you remember when you heard that the Berlin Wall had opened? Uh, the, when the Berlin World Wall was open, I had just returned from a patrol in the Baltic, actually. And so, how did how how did you react 
to that uh, news. Yeah, well, I came home, had a large party with some of my colleagues, and then, <laughs> and when we came back, we were sort of like, sitting like, like hmm, what to do? What now? What now? Hmm, I wonder. <laughs> that kind so, of... So at that point, did you think that is the beginning of the end? Not really. Um because if if we return to the geography of where we are, uh, you can never ever Russia will you know it's you don't put baby in the corner right that that's that Russia. Um, as long as we sit on both sides of the Atlantic, they can't move freely. They have no room. Um, you have uh, the, the Royal Navy sitting there. You have the Norwegian, you have the Danish, uh, German, Pol- Dutch, Belgian, French, mm. Portuguese, maybe Spanish. Okay. Um, but they sit on one side and the Americans sit on one side. So if you control both sides of the water, there will just be a small gap in the middle that you have to cover. And then you can have your supplies running. It's the same, same shit. It's this doesn't change. Same as the world war two. Yeah, run it across the North Atlantic and everything is fine. So that's why they wanted to have their subs to be able to come down there and the surface vessels to come out as well. The subs could possibly come. They would probably be able to come down there, but their surface fleet would be smoking wreck before it ever left the Baltic or came around the North Cape. That's That was the, the tactics. Uh, the whole plan was called... In the Baltic, the whole plan was called Operation Hurricane. I know. I don't know if you ever heard about that one. No. It was actually sort of a layered rolling defense um, starting east of Bornholm as soon as we got hold on uh, what was coming. And that was probably because there was a Danish submarine sitting outside Leningrad. Oh, don't quote me on that. Um, could be a German. But don't we call. never betray our sources on Cold War conversation. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> so, so, of course, they had early warning. So what would happen is that uh, the Germans would scramble their two Marineflieger uh, squadrons, mm-hmm. and that would be uh, some 144 uh, tornado with the Exocet missiles just screaming through them. When they were done, the Danish F-16s would come across. When they were done, they would have a hailstorm of harpoon missiles from the Danish vessels. When they were done, then they were presumably close to Bornholm, what was left of them. The Germans would come in with Exocet missiles and the harp, uh, what we call penguins, short range ones. Mm-hmm. And when they were done, grenades and torpedoes. And Imagine this, that if you have to maneuver a rather large naval force in constricted waters, you're fucked, basically. If the enemy just peppers you, you don't even have to take aim uh, uh, with the harpoon on that range. You just say, pop up and hit whatever you can see. And if you fire all, you have a wave of, let's see, uh, bum, 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 bum. you have a wave of loosely 80 harpoons from the fast aircraft and another 24 coming in from the frigates. And then on top of that comes the XS-8 missiles. So they will be bloody busy. And nobody gives a shit about hitting a warship as such, but to hit their landing crafts, the big ones. A frigate can't do anything. It can't invade your country. But if you can kill off a marine division out there, then you're good. So the concept was that when that was over, the next thing that we would hit was Danish, German, possibly also Swedish, but nobody, don't talk about that, submarines in the deep part of the uh, the, uh, Baltic, east of Bornholm, and then they hit the mines. So it, it's so, sort of like a, a very nasty way of running the gauntlet to get out. Yeah. Yeah. 
And and were there? I mean, I'm aware of that Soviet submarine um, getting into Swedish waters in the 1980s. Were there any submarine incursions into Danish waters? Too shallow. Right. Okay. Uh, they could. Pr- that we probably had. Uh, they could easily go into the deep part of Baltic before, as mentioned before. Yeah. Uh, or maybe incur make an incursion from the north going in through uh, Skagerrak and into Kattegat, but they couldn't get further because then the waters just get too shallow. Right. Right. That's, okay. That's why uh, it's so funny with uh, <laughs> Tom Clancy has uh, Los Angeles class go through Danish waters undiscovered. <laughs> Yeah. That was when I stopped reading Tom Clancy. <laughs> right, right. Well, you can obviously tell I'm not a sailor. I come up with all the stupid questions. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, um, but but it, this is um, – you have very narrow uh, sea lanes. You can't maneuver. You can run afoul or you run into a minefield. So – that's why um, the idea of the uh, nukes or the nerve gas came into play. So, okay, maybe we lose a few ships, but we don't want them to control the shoreline, so we'll just kill them all. There are only five millions. Who gives? It's quite cynical. Just actually flatten Denmark, because then there's no problem. And And, and this is the... Um, this actually more or less matches uh, what's found in in Poland, as you mentioned, these attack plans. Um, we have a um, proliferant uh, writer, an old uh, colonel, um, who served um, in Yugoslavia and had the f- famous fight down there with the uh, leopard tanks. Um, but he's when the uh, curtain disappeared, uh, we had a um, bilateral agreement with the Poles, and we were setting up this uh, rapid reaction force. And he served down there on, on the staff, and then he served uh, alongside a Polish special forces officer. And um, this Polish uh, officer is sort of knew many strange and very intimate things about this, uh, this colonel. And then on on a festive occasion and over a lot of vodka, he told me that was poor. His his squad was assigned to kill him. <laughs> wow! Just just matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Did did you work closely with the Swedish armed forces or not? Uh, not officially. I thought that would be the answer. Yeah. Uh, tell me anything about that or not? Mostly, this was on on a more on on a, um, on a search and rescue kind of uh, basis. We could the the lots big uh, uh, nat- bilateral exercises, uh, sort of catastrophe as because we had the Scandinavian star and we had the Estonia. Yeah. Uh, so obviously we had to start to, to do some sort of teamwork so we could pool all our uh, assets into yeah. a common effort, right? And that was a, a great occasion to work with the with the Swedish Navy. And um, also we have um, running besides this um, NATO thing, we of course we have a sort of uh, common Nordic um, cooperation. Uh, it's it's nothing with a, a exercises or anything like. That. It's mainly on um, on training level, uh, especially among the cadets and uh, the midshipmen. Every year we meet up with the academies of the other Nordic countries and have a big uh, big competition and a big party and more big parties and more big parties and then competitions. Um, but you learn. How you, you sort of you, you get to know how they work. You know their mentality, and also um, we work together with the uh, with the Finns and the Swedes as well uh, in uh, in UN missions. Yeah. 
So we have a, a rather intimate knowledge about each other. So anyway, it just sort of, what can you say, off NATO. Um, Finns are great. Great fighters, great soldiers, great people. Swedes are fine too, um, as are Norwegians. We are Scandinavians after all. We are not that far from each other. Yeah. And now we have the Baltics in as well. We have a little, little Baltic club um, because we don't like the Russians. No, uh, <laughs> no it, it's not that. But 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 we have history. Yeah, there's always been that Nordic cooperation. I mean, Sweden and Norway were one country, weren't they, up until the end of the last century? Yeah, that was because, sorry, not the last century, the nineteenth. Anyway, yeah, that was because Sweden stole Norway from us. Um, You're sounding like the British, where you know, we, you know, that country used to be ours. <laughs> Yeah, well, we're, we're small, so we're allowed to. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 no. Uh, no. We, uh, we used to control half of Britain. Well, really. yeah, yeah, if you want to go back that far. <laughs> I'm a historian, uh, I do. Yeah. yeah. And we have further photos, videos and information on this episode in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Don't forget, if you'd like to get one of those Cold War Conversations coasters help keep us on the air, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And if you can't wait for the next episode, do visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.